This podcast is recorded on stolen and unceded Aboriginal land. We acknowledge the First Nations and elders of this country and we join their calls for justice. Kill, kill, kill. <laughs> Did you think it was bad? I thought I thought the land of ad was bad. Um, though I did write it. You'll you'll notice it's all about intergenerational war and shitting on boomers. And this is this is direct from the mind of Tom Ballard. So I was it, a consulting producer. You're on this just whole mad event. because they're stealing your bit. <laughs> <laughs> no one else came up with the idea that boomers mm. are shit. I mean, first of all, the budget No one else has ever done generation stuff. Yeah, I'm the first one. The budget on this, as as someone vaguely involved in the media who has some kind of aspirations to one day work on a TV show or Australian film, holy shit, the the level of money they must spend on the production values of these ads every year is fucking through. This looks like there's more going on here visually and sort of cinematically than anything else on Australian screens for the rest of the year, which is particularly depressing. But what did you think about it? <laughs> Australian, so so this is the ad that's produced, what they produce it every year. For how long has Very this long been going time. on? Very long time. Sam always was, yeah, is always the face of it. He's always like, eat lamb, lamb good. There's nothing worse than being un-Australian. I should know. I've been Australian all my life. And I'm sickened by the creeping tide of un-Australianism eroding our great traditions, like our custom of eating lamb on Australia Day. And then it sort of became a thing. A few years ago, it was anti-woke. It was about fuck all these people, Australia Day rules, eat meat. In more recent years, they've gone, no, we should be woke, actually. Okay. And we should actually, you know, do a welcome to country before our lamb ad and and rep, and and go for this new angle that lamb brings us all together as a nation. Right. Brings us all together. With, yeah, like the new, new broadly acceptable approach to the 26th of January, which is like, why can't we all just get along? Yes. So and it's Australian lamb is what like the peak body of for lamb the <laughs> just a lobby group or I guess so it's one of those weird ads you see every I'm now and again you see that on TV for just like butter like not a specific brand but just hey guys just eat butter or just eat pork get some yeah, pork ready for like, so yes it must be the the lobby group well, big that butter funds it I and, mean yeah <laughs> it's big lamb <laughs> big lamb does this every year and they do it before Australia Day because they're like they want to be like lamb is Australian and being Australian is good. And therefore lamb is good and you should eat it. And it's always like, I mean, I guess what's interesting is, yeah, like the whole, the, it, it, this is uh, an industry that is conscious that maybe it is uh, old fashioned or like losing favor, like probably less people are eating lamb. And so what it always feels like to me is the framing, like the positioning is this is a traditional thing that you should get back into. Like every yes. single year it's like, remember this? Yes. You should get get back into this and so they've got to tie it to like something old in a way but then to the new you know why you should bring it into your modern life did the good people of twitter slash x not like this ad is that the consensus well of course it's because people share it out of outrage people share it because they love it um it's it's of course marketing genius because it's in you know outrage intergenerational so of course so different generations can share it or laugh at it my outrage is that <laughs> I, the politics of the ad towards the end, as with all ads, is so infuriating. As someone who takes, who politics, cares about politics, though? someone. Okay, I know the line that you're talking about because there's the bit where then there's the generational gap, which is um, very creatively visualized as a literal gap in yes. the earth. Watch out for the generation gap. Uh, yes. That then begins to close as they kind of start yelling out things that they have in common or whatever. But it, it is confusing, right, because they're like, coffee could be hotter, and then one of them says, It's okay you spent $368 billion on submarines. Yeah. It's okay that you spent $368 <laughs> billion dollars on submarines. <laughs> and the boomer goes, It was an impulse buy. Yeah, it was an impulse buy. And it is yeah. kind of, it's unclear, right, whether we're meant to be like, yeah, we should all just let that go. <laughs> <I know>. or- <laughs> like, it's not equivalent. It's like, who cares about the $368 billion we're investing coffee in these war machines? We have lamb and a hot coffee. I will pay the hot coffee joke. I thought that was generally a funny joke. I, I'm involved with that. I thought the phone torchlight thing when she's walking around yeah. Boomerville, I thought that was pretty funny. Fine. Yeah. All good. But yes, the idea the idea that we can all come together, put our differences aside and ignore the fact that we're spending $368 billion on the Orca submarines and we should all just come together and eat some fucking lamb really annoyed but, me. Okay, but that's the point. Like 
the irony of this ad is that it is so boomer brained in that thing of trying to be like, let's just put politics aside because politics doesn't really matter, guys. Like we should just, you know, whether it's spending $368 billion on submarines or the fact that like, haha, boomers get a house, like they include all of these things. It's like, oh yeah, it's so much easier for boomers and like cost of living is really hard for young people. And then also though, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's okay. Well, there's a line in the end where they're like, being a young person in Australia must be difficult. Being an old person must be pretty tricky too. Probably. So it's kind of throwing a little bit of doubt on there. But yeah, those are not equivalent in terms of like things like buying a house. It is genuinely way harder for young people yeah. to do that than those old fucks who were giving away free houses, as we saw at the start yeah. in Boomerville at the Boomer Gazette. Yeah. But I think the most sinister stuff is at the end when the young woman of colour hugs the old white oh. boomer and they say, Good to have the country back together. We weren't ever that far apart, sweetheart. <sighs> And in fact, we were never that far apart. Now, to me, this is a like a referendum reference too. This is you also reckon? like, yeah, this is a little bit like, oh, we're so divided, we should all come together. But of course, this is a lamb ad based around Australia Day slash January 26 slash Invasion Day, one of the most divisive flashpoints in the culture war mm. in fucking Australia. And we're mm. not all coming together over some fucking lamb. Also, it doesn't make any sense because the Gen Z gender fluid Hippies would all be vegetarians. They well, don't yeah, eat it's fucking like, lamb, you it's idiots. It's the twinkiest young gay guy <laughs> that, that starts it, that smells the smell of lamb and goes, is that lamb? Is that lamb? Like, <laughs> What is this, like, lamb thing? That's got riz. Wow, that lamb smells slay. Um, <laughs> damn, I'm going to eat that lamb and leave no crumbs. Yes, hunty, that I'm eating lamb. Mothered. <laughs> well, as you pointed out, people on YouTube apparently fucking love this this ad. Yeah. All the comments were very positive. Yeah, it's literally like comment after comment that I started to wonder if these are like big lamb bots because it's just like great ad. Wow, finally a good ad. Brilliant commercial. <laughs> well done. And who doesn't love lamb? You smashed it out of the, <laughs> out of the park. I stayed actually stayed around to watch this ad. This one says, OMG, as a millennial, this video slaps no cap for real, for real. <laughs> Which is a reference to the millennial trying to. I thought the millennials rock climbing was also pretty good. That was pretty like, funny. Bolding. That was yeah. also fine. Yeah. Finally, fine. a great advertisement. Off to get lamb now. <laughs> <laughs> the system works. So, you know. <laughs> oh, well, I love lamb and I love this country and. I just hope all the generations can get along hmm. and further capitalism and keep buying the meat that is oh, the uh, little comes baby. from animals. Which, as I slaughtered. understand it, the defi- as a vegetarian, I understand it, lamb by definition means it's a baby, right? It is, it a, is little, a little yeah, child. Little yeah, little baby. And softer that way. Happy Australia Day, everyone. <laughs> there is this wickedness about the Greens. The, 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 the sheer illegitimacy of the Greens on this issue is disgusting. Oh dear me, imagine being excited to see Adam Band. What is wrong with these people? We're stuck with the hosts of Chapo Shithouse podcast. This is, this is, this is a serious danger to Australia. G'day, g'day, fellow Aussies. <laughs> this is Serious Danger, a podcast about green politics in Australia. I'm Emerald Moon. That's Tom Ballard. Hello. Um, we don't do an official Greens Party podcast here. It's just not something we do. It's just not something we're interested in. No, thanks. Instead, we're interested in doing a show that's made possible with the help of the Green Institute and produced by Michael LeGriff Griffin. And this week, we're going to be joined by the New South Wales Greens MP for Newtown, Jenny Leong, to discuss the fight for a free Palestine and what we can expect from the political year ahead. Um, fun fact, in 2023, Jenny Leong was re-elected in Newtown with a primary vote of 54%, <gasps> which is heckers and makes her the first and only Greens MP to win more than 50% of the primary vote. So she's the coolest. Isn't that crazy? Adam Bant only got 49.6% yeah, in 2022. She's higher than, than Adam. So, so maybe go. he'll beat yeah. him at the next election and crack the 50% mark, but more than 50% we'll primary, see. you just get elected. No preferences, motherfucker. I know, that's wild. Imagine not even having to watch references. <laughs> um, quick thank you to our new patrons before we get into it. Thomas, Rochelle, Tom, Joe, and Martin. We love you a lot. Um, you. We 
we have so much shit over on the Patreon. If you want to go and listen to it, it's only three bucks a month if you're not a member already. We use the money that comes in there to pay Mike's wages. Mike makes the show happen. So without you lovely patrons, show doesn't happen. So if you're listening, I imagine you like the show happening. So I don't know, <laughs> something to think about. <laughs> <laughs> be the change you want to be, you want to see in the world. That's right. Whatever. Think local, think global, act local. <laughs> Another quick reminder, just uh, before we get into it with Jenny, uh, I am doing this comedy gig for Mandy Nolan on January Wednesday, January 24th in Mullumbimby. It's called Some Like It Less Hot because of climate change and comedy. Uh, Mandy has been pre-selected as the Richmond campaign uh, uh, candidate once again, uh, the campaign to turn the seat of Richmond green. She came so close last time. This will raise a bit of cash for that and it'll be a really fun show. Mandy's emceeing, I'm telling jokes. Mandy for richmond.com forward slash summer standup. We'll put the link in the show notes. But if you're in Mullum, if you're around that kind of area, come on down. It'd be great to see people there. That kind of area. Yeah, invading my hometown. I don't even think I'm going to be there, but, you know. <laughs> Send all your, your little mom hippie, hippie circus friends along too, <laughs> if they could afford it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's quite a severe economic and housing crisis down there. Well, so that's, that's what I was referencing. Me. Yes, that's what I meant. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I took a train to Sydney, the overnight express. Didn't know where to go. I had All right, let's get our co-host on the show. Jenny Leong has been the Greens MP for the city of Newtown since 2015. She's the New South Wales Greens spokesperson for housing and is the co-chair of the New South Wales Parliamentary Friends of Palestine. Delighted to have you here. Thank you so much, Jenny. Welcome to Serious Danger. Thank you so much for having me. Yay. The have most you watched popular the green. First <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, number one popular green. Uh, we talked about your primary vote earlier on. Congratulations on that. Beating out of Thank band. you we very much. That. Thanks Huge. very much. <laughs> <laughs> Even the Australian had to report on it when the election happened. It was a classic. Suck shit. <laughs> That's why I read about it. Yes. Take that, Rupert. <laughs> um, have you watched the Lamb ad? Yes. That's what everyone's talking about. I have watched it and... I heard everyone talk about it before I'd seen it. And can yes. I just say that in my head, knowing the history of lamb ads, I was like ready <laughs> for bad, right? And it was I just I just feel like it was like beyond even knowing where to start about what was <laughs> bad about it. Like I could give you a full, like, you know, four hour analysis. like race analysis, like a yellow peril <laughs> analysis, a like you know, we can have a total like capitalist analysis, like, you know, not wow. to mention the vegans. Like I was just, it was too much. It was too much. <laughs> I think it was designed to trigger Green's MP specifically. Oh my God. Can I just say like my, my seven-year-old daughter walked up to my phone while I was watching it and I said, oh, this is really bad, darling. I'm not sure if you want to watch it. And at the end she said, what was that for? <laughs> well, that's for Australia. I feel like I feel like that is, you know, it sums it up for me. It really does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is what is that for? On a more existential level, like on a you know, yeah. What are we yeah. doing with our lives? Yeah. In what this is, the, the bit that really can I just you know because I've always got a I've got always got an Asian bent that really the bit <laughs> that got to me right. So it's sort of the double the double whammy of all the the white Aussies all at the Barbie like the older generation and then the people that could have been international students you know in the high rise kind of yeah. Asia s <laughs> kind of vibe. But then, like, knowing that they would have got critiqued for looking like all the people that were older in Australia are all white. So they had the token Chinese yeah. or Asian guy oh, at the yes. end that I looked did. like the mad uncle or the guy that ran the country Chinese shop in the R- like the Chinese <laughs> restaurant in the RSL. And it was like, like seriously. And they're like, like <laughs> cancel, cancel. Yeah, that yeah was and he just, like, everyone else was properly dressed. And he sort of had this old crusty white shirt on, like he'd just been <laughs> yeah, doing the dishes just, like, out the back or something, kind of, you know. Like, yeah. You say you look like my dad doing the gardening, right? It's like totally that. <laughs> as long as you're eating lamb, we don't give a shit. Even if you're a <laughs> weird right. Chinese man, you're welcome. Yeah. Unless you're a seven-year-old and wonder why is anyone eating lamb? Why? Why is it? <laughs> well, they cute and cuddly. Seven-year-olds are the lambs of people. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's it's really it's really bad. Like. 
Yeah. Well, it'll certainly, certainly get a lot of views. It's uh, it's doing well on YouTube. I assume you're mm. going to be boycotting the traders at Woolworths as well, who have announced Look. that they uh, aren't additioning any, aren't including any additional Australia Day merchandise. And of course, Peter, Peter, how, Bin, how Peter Dutton is, is saying that we should boycott them. It's pretty. Oh good. my gosh! Can I just say NASA from APAN, the, the Palestinian Action Network's take on this, saying that we can all you know back in Peter Dutton now because he supports boycotts. <laughs> boycotts are good now. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not. Uh, you know, it's like uh, not all boycotts are equal, or you know, whatever it is. It's they just work. truly. Uh, look, I've I've never been a, a big fan of the the major price gouging uh, mega <laughs> uh, supermarkets. I'm not sure that they really know what they're doing with this one, to be honest. Because apparently, Peter Dutton is worried that it's all a little too political statement. But apparently, they're doing less rather than more, so it's all yeah. a bit unclear. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. It's like I'll focus on selling food and, and not doing politics. It's like, well, but yeah. the Australia Day merchandise isn't food. And then I looked exactly. into it yeah. and it's literally they're not they're like you can still buy Australian flags. You can buy whatever yeah. the fuck. There's a whole yeah. bunch of stuff covered in Australian There'll be flag Aussie lamb there they for sure. It's so certainly lamb. <laughs> That's right. But it's like they weren't doing any additional stock and they sell yeah. that mm. other stuff year round at Big yeah. W. Yes. And it doesn't make any sense. It's so they basically like the won't display. be putting the really, really offensive Aussie, Aussie, <laughs> Aussie, yeah. we invaded your country and destroyed your people shit yes. all over their store. Yeah. Yeah. Australia established 1788, that kind of shit. I yeah. Guess that's yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. won't be putting up a terra nullius map, sadly. Yeah. <laughs> and that means that they're then straying into matters that they shouldn't be, whereas the doing that, the, like, overreach of the big stalls in the middle of the aisle, that oh wasn't gosh. wading into politics. That was not political. That, <laughs> no, was no, that no. wasn't telling people how to uh, approach Australia. That was Australia. just doing their jobs. But also it's they've cited that it's because of lack of demand. Like there's there's a gradual decline in demand for these products. Yeah. It's the free market in fucking yeah. action, you <laughs> capitalist psycho. But also this is the thing is they're not actually doing it from any principled stabs about, you know, colonisation no, and genocide. No. They're just doing it because they don't make as much money out of it yeah, as they could and so they're going to start stocking more hot cross buns, you know? Yes. <laughs> no, that's why Woolworths does anything. Like, and yet the, both major parties on this and on the price gouging stuff continue to yeah. be like, hey, can you guys explain to us why you're doing things? It's like it is so simple. My because friends. of money. <laughs> money. Money. I want to know I want to know what Coles is going to do though, right? Does Coles just go all out like Aussie 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 to make a yes. distinction, you know? Or they put up the, you know, Aboriginal flag like Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> it will Who knows? like it becomes a war, I don't know. It will become like the flag off, you know? And the there's so off, many flag right. offs at the moment. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's talk about more important things then. Things that actually matter. Um, we want to have you on. For, we've been wanting to have you on the show for a long time, but um, particularly lately, you've been really involved, standing up for Palestine uh, in New South Wales, and taking a really active role. You've been dealing with a whole lot of horrific criticism for that, of course, and a pretty cowardly uh, New South Wales Labor government in yeah. the government of Chris Minns. I guess for people out across it, can you give us a sense of what your fight for Palestine's looked like in in New South Wales over the past couple of months since yeah. Israel's? War yeah, Gaza broke out yeah thanks so much. And it, it feels like a it feels like a struggle for those of us that have been involved in Palestinian justice and been pushing for this, a struggle that has been, you know, something that started 75 years ago, not on the 7th of October. And it's mm. like there's a real kind of risk that there's an erasure of that injustice that has been decades and decades long in an attempt to kind of link it all to what happened in October as a starting point. And I think that one of the things that I have been completely sort of like overwhelmed by has been the public support and response and action in response mm. to solidarity with Palestine. Like I, I used to work at Amnesty International for for many, many years. I've been doing a lot of um, uh, advocacy and work around Palestine and human rights issues in, in that region and never have I seen this level of global support for Palestine, never have we seen these kind of actions. Like we're talking in Sydney now, it's 14 weeks of every week actions where tens of thousands of people have joined in some of the biggest ones, 50,000 people on the streets. So you're talking, you know, hundreds of thousands of people over the last 14 weeks that have continuously turned up, showed up and been there in solidarity. And those contingents are growing, you know, like the mm. youth trade union movement support is growing. But like we don't, as activists, like I would prefer that we don't have to have these mass rallies because what yeah. we want to be happening is that the genocide is not occurring. Mm. What we yeah. want is for though what is the horrific doesn't even go close to the word, right? It's like what is happening in Gaza and what is ha has been happening in Gaza 
has been horrific beyond belief, you know, and you think about it on a day-to-day level of the impact and we've heard it in the last, you know, in the in the most recent reports with all credit to them, South Africa coming out and taking the action at the International Court of Justice to hear them document the level of destruction and devastation, the forced displacement, the death, the attacks on archives, the attacks on children, the fact that they're performing sort of, you know, absolutely intense emergency surgery and action without any anaesthetic, like all of this is yeah. is is vile. And then we have an Australian government and a, and a Labor government at both New South Wales and federal level who are taking the most terrific stats on this. Like, you know, Chris Mills to jump on board, light up the opera house in the Israeli flag colours Yeah, when we know that Amnesty International and other key human rights organisations had been basically taking a position that Israeli state was running an apartheid regime against the Palestinians mm. and he's lit up the opera house in the colour of that country's flag mm. and then you have the New South Wales police running basically a protection racket for the Prime Minister trying to stop the protests, trying to stop the actions, mm. crack down on peaceful protests with these sort of draconian anti-protest laws. It's a it's a pretty dire mm. situation in terms of democracy. The the two bits of hope, because I feel like it just like, you know, you're supposed to be like, you know, not getting too dark about this. It's hard not to get dark about it. The two bits of hope I feel like are the incredible solidarity that we're seeing now from South Africa and them leading the international charge and the sense of strength people hold in sort of a globi- global anti-colonialist, like anti-settler um, move around mm. the world. The global actions for Palestine have been strong. The link to First Nations justice here has been strong, yeah. and that's a global phenomenon. And then I think that the second bit of hope is that I've seen in New South Wales politics as the co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Palestine, I've worked with some good Labor people who are, have been showing up week after week, and we've organised what was a, a le- letter calling on the Australian government to support an immediate ceasefire and respect international law. And that has now been signed by 300 former and current elected representatives, local, state, federal, across the country, re- reflecting, I think, what is the genuine view of people rather than the really spineless stats that we're seeing from the Albanese Labor government at the moment. Mm. Was there some Liberal MPs who, who signed up to that too? Yeah, Did there I were. See? There yeah, were. Right, I and it's, and I think it's, it's interesting to see that there are, is a real connection where the trauma that is being felt because, I mean, this is the thing, it's almost it's almost like Palestinian Australians have been erased from, the, erased from the narrative in this discussion. So we talk, you know, you hear the political leaders talking about the impact of anti-Semitism, you hear them, you know, Chris Minns has gone to visit like, you know, Jewish um, community groups, they're meeting with the Jewish Board of Deputies, they're meeting with all of these people all the time. There's very little public discussion about what they're doing to provide support to the trauma being felt by Palestinian Australians here, to the people who are seeking asylum here, Mm. to those communities. And I think that there are definitely Liberal representatives and Labor representatives, particularly in the western parts, the western seats of Sydney, that represent those communities that know the trauma and the heartache and and the absolute stress that is impacted by having family living in the middle of a genocidal attack with the government refusing to take a stance on that. And they feel that and they and they know that. Having said that, I think it's really important to say that any sort of, because people have been talking about, you know, the electoral benefits of it and the change of support and people are saying we're never going to vote for Albanese again or whatever. Like in this situation, like I don't want those votes. Like the Greens don't want those votes. I don't want those votes to go to the Liberals. I don't want them to go anywhere. I want the Australian government to take a principled stance against the genocide happening in Gaza. Mm. And they are just, it is beyond belief to me how morally bankrupt both Minns and Albanese have been in relation to this. Like it is truly beyond belief. It's been pretty clear, right, pretty clarifying, as we've discussed on the show a fair bit. And to your point about the lack of attention on the impacts of anti-Palestinian bigotry and Islamophobia. I mean, there was this crazy story this week 
about an improvised car bomb that was left on the bonnet of a car in, in the city suburb of Botany outside a house that was flying the Palestinian flag. The bomb was made up of a dark green jerry can with a small amount of fuel inside. Have you seen a photo of the bomb? Yeah, yeah, seen I've yeah. seen it. I've seen it. It's yeah. got rags stuffed in the open lid, large bolts taped to the side and a disposable lighter taped to the top and there was a handwritten note attached to it saying, enough, take down flag, one chance. Uh, the bomb squad was called in. They sent in a robot. Eventually, it was it was described as, as safe, you know, like it was yeah. actually like not actually going to yeah. explode anytime soon, but still would be terrifying for that person involved and would be an act of terrorism. It got a little bit of coverage, but you might not have read about it because there was a fiftieth fucking article about some actors wearing a scarf during an STC production. Like, yeah. the, the, should we be surprised at the disparity between the focus on a story like that, someone being almost killed and bombed in their family home because they're flying a Palestinian flag compared to the attention on and the the pearl clutching about yeah. um, about anti-Semitism across society. Yeah. Mm. The the scarf apparently causes a lot more trauma than the bomb. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, the, the fact, I mean, there's, there's probably a, a few kind of takes on that. The first is to say that Sadly, in New South Wales particularly, we have been seeing like this kind of dis- disconnect between the police response to Palestinian action versus the response to to other action really, really come to the forefront where the politicisation of the New South Wales police around this is is intense. We, you know, to give you an example, early on in um, some, some NTU members at Sydney University made a banner that said ceasefire and there's like a, a footbridge that goes over the main road in Sydney on Parramatta Road and they we w- went up and hung the banner there right well in the afternoon and you know like it was like a kind of honk for interview support a ceasefire kind of action mm. the police were called and the police went up and they said oh we need you to take the banner down because you're inciting violence the banner Cease literally fire. said <laughs> ceasefire now like there is Fucking it is hell. like ceasefire now is the complete opposite of inciting yeah. violence <sighs> And wow. then you had the the complete sort of overreaction to the incredible, you know, incredibly brave like actions of the SDC and shout out to all of those incredible artists that then got a mass kind of petition together of artists in support of Palestine around wearing the kefir. But you also see a situation where in this case, and you, I mean, you mentioned it, Tom, like it's this idea of like, you know, what is an act of terror? Mm. And I think we it was pretty clear after 9-11 that acts of terror can cannot be uh, instigated by white people, <laughs> right? Let's be really clear. Like what we're saying here is that if you do something, like if America goes in or Israel goes in and bombs uh, ICU departments where children are in, that's not an act of terror, mm. right? That's self-defense, that's justice, that's freedom, you know? But if a brown person does it, is a pers- if a Muslim person does it, terrorism. you know, if, if the Chinese Communist Party does it, mm. terrorism, you know, terrorism, mm. threat to our yeah. sense of identity and security. And this is where I think the intersection between South Africa taking this action at the International Court of Justice is powerful on a bigger scale that shifts the balance because what we're seeing here is a global connection around solidarity that recognise that white Western powers need to see that their sense of justice has been founded on the basis of so much injustice. And there's a connect here that I think is being, you know, forged by the response to the attacks in Palestine right now and really led by the staunch Palestinian and First Nations people around the world that are pushing this agenda. I want to talk about that in a sec, but just before we move on, I also yeah. want to give a shout out to this homeowner in question. Apparently his name is oh Theo, they're yes. keeping his do actual it, name uh, secretly, but he sounds like a fucking legend, okay? The man, this is from a, an article in the SMH, the man put a notice board out the front of his home, which included dot points about the Israel-Palestine conflict and his name and phone number welcoming text from people who agreed or disagreed with his oh views. Oh, my gosh, I love Theo. Move. Amazing move. That's great. He said to the media, this person didn't text me an argument. They planted a bomb where, where the person I love, the animals I love sleep. I'm not trying mm-hmm. to hide, but it was an act of cowardice. Scurrying in the night to plant your little bomb on my car, it leaves a bitter taste. There's nowhere to spit but in this person's face. <laughs> Incredible line. Okay, that's sick. And he said he would not take down the flag or the notice board, uh, but he had up security. Fuck them. We won't bow to this terror, he says. 
Theo. Oh my gosh, yes, Theo. I like Theo. Solidarity. Theo is great. Oh my gosh, maybe I'm going to do a community recognition statement for Theo when I'm back in Parliament next Ooh, year yeah. in, in February. Get him out. There is like nowhere that. to spit, but in this person's oh my gosh. face. Oh my gosh. I'm going to say that more. Yeah. It's a, just on a, on, a, on, a, on a serious note on that, like I think it is, like this is the thing that also just got kind of totally disconnected is this idea of like when the response to what happened around October 7 happened, you saw the New South Wales Labor government do this knee-jerk reaction to to strengthen like anti vilification laws, basically to give police more power. Yeah. We've mm. been seeing like Islamophobia, anti-Palestinian re- rhetoric, anti-Chinese rhetoric during COVID happen for years and years and years and there's been no push for that. And then all of a sudden there was this mm. moment and it was like, oh, we have to strengthen the anti-vilification laws, they're not working. And so it's so disingenuous the way that those things are done. You, you imagine had that been the other way around in response to an Israeli flag, what the response would have been. Oh, yeah. yeah. They move quickly when they want to. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And you're right, the level of coverage on it is less because, mm. you know, well, there's so many takes as to why, but, yeah. <laughs> but CO, yeah. great. Great we stuff. <laughs> um, should we talk about the South Africa case? Have you watched any of it, Emerald? Did it, we were sort of recording this before no. the second day of the hearings when Israel's given its response, but the South African uh, lawyers sort of started laying out the case in the International Criminal Court of Justice trying to, well, alleging that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza and urging the court to make a ruling to try and make it stop ASAP. The material confirms the rights and issue and their violation. That Israel has committed and is committing acts capable of being characterised as genocidal. You have heard from Ms. Hassim about direct extermination of thousands of people and children of the Palestinian population in Gaza since 7 October last year. And South Africa and the world together stand witness to the forced evacuation of over 85% of the population of Gaza from their homes and the herding of them into ever smaller areas without adequate shelter or medical care to be attacked, killed and harmed. So, the rights are immediately and urgently in need of protection because of the ongoing denial by Israel of the conditions necessary for life. It is difficult, with respect, to think of a clearer or more abundantly urgent case. Have you had a chance to check it out, Jenny? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's pretty damning, isn't it? It's, it's beyond damning to hear it all sort of like, you know, in a, in a very kind of clear and measured way articulate that level of horror. Mm. Um, I think you, I think what is so powerful about it is to see the international community weigh in. The, the bit that stood out for me was the, the bit where the contribution that was made that people are being subjected to this genocide and are able to record it and show it to the world. And this is the first mm. time in history we have had that level of technology such that people are documenting and presenting their own genocide as it is occurring. Yeah, live streaming their own genocide. That is a yeah. that is a pretty, pretty remarkable. You know, remarkable situation, but also makes it even more unforgivable for the yeah. international community not to be acting. Yeah. It's pretty wild because people are like, oh, this case is ridiculous. It has no merit. And the lawyers are just getting up there and just quite calmly quoting yeah. direct quotes from the prime minister and president of Israel, like Israeli leaders and officials laying out very clearly a, ra- a number of quotes over a very consistent period of time that lays out a genocidal intent and making it, yeah. and they've mm. said openly about what they plan to do to Gaza and what has to mm. happen there. Yeah. And I think that that's like, that's the important kind of thing, you know, that I've seen, I've seen a few people pointing this out, that the, the purpose of this case is not necessarily to prove that a genocide has been committed and then, you know, punish Israel for that. Primarily, it is to identify, like the, the point of this, this process under the Genocide Convention is to identify the early stages of a genocide to mm. stop it from being completed, you know, carried yeah. out. And yeah. so that's what they're trying to show is that there is an intent to, to carry out a genocide and to halt it. Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, so if these, if South Africa can make the case that there is reasonable grounds for like genocide, mm. you know, may very well be happening here. This is just in terms of legal arguments. Yeah. Then the court can order, uh, make an order on Israel to, to stop the 
a war right now mm-hmm. to then proceed to the next level of the case. So, yeah. you know, an immediate halt to Israel's current actions, basically imposing a ceasefire through the ICJ is the immediate short-term goal. Mm-hmm. The actual genocide cases would probably take a very long time to actually, you know, fully pro- yeah. prove and lay out under international law. But that's certainly what they're what they're going for. How soon could we get that kind of um, decision, like... You know? I believe they were sort of saying like next month is when you, mm. they'll get the actual ruling in terms of emergency uh, measures and, and like early provisions, that kind of thing. So, yes, yeah. it does move pretty slowly. And, of course, before it's even begun, Israel's already said this is bullshit. They described South Africa as the legal arm of Hamas what the fuck and accused does- them of playing <laughs> advocate of yeah. the devil. Yeah. Um, now, yeah. again, it, it is, as we say, it is important. It is good, and I think it's 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 good that it's uh, being put out there and has the attention that it has. But as I was reading this ABC article, the court will not rule the time of the genocide allegations. That proceeding could take years. The ICJ's decisions are also final and without appeal, but the court has no way to enforce them. Yeah. And lots of people have been sort of mm. making this move now, like, okay, even if this case is made, even if the court order is made, do we actually think that Israel will listen to that order when, again, the US has already dismissed mm. this case as lacking in merit? Do you think it could actually have an effect or is that not really the point, Jenny? I think when something like this is happening, you need to use all the means you have available to you. Mm. People you know, people say, well, why did the, did the actors at the STC wear the kefir you know, at the at the curtain call, people say, "Well, what action can the ICJ really take to to demand this?" You know, oh, why why do we care if you know some politicians add an aid to a petition? What difference is it going to make if we rock up and do an action? Well, we don't know at what point we're going to have all done enough to stop mm. people being killed in Gaza and displaced. Mm. So we don't know how much effort it's going to take before we have a free Palestine. So until we get to that point, we have to do all the things we have, right? Mm. There's a beautiful sense of analogy of like you may have, you know, you may have a, a all of the of the weight of thousands of people behind you, or you may have one grain of sand. Whatever you have available to be able to help to get this justice, add it to the cause. Mm. Yeah. And so if there are international lawyers and countries that are willing to take this action at the ICJ, then yes, we should absolutely do that. If we can also get hundreds of thousands of people on the street, yes, we should do that. If if there are artists and healthcare workers and trade unionists that want to mobilise for Palestine, then we should do that. Like all of these things need to be done and eventually we will get to the point where we have a free Palestine. We can't sit there and say just because we're not sure if our one small thing will make a difference mm. or whether it will be the right answer that we say, oh, well, then it's we just go back to, you know, cooking our lamb on the barbie. <laughs> You know, because that, that's, that's what it feels like. It feels like otherwise, maybe that's what, what do the we region do? needs, you know, more lamb. It apparently brings everyone together. Mm. Oh, my gosh, you know how they have those little, like, you know when you do the steaks where you put the flags like on the, the steaks to say, like, rare, medium rare. They could do yes. They could do a version. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted <laughs> by that. I just had that It's all thought. good ideas. Yeah. What, yeah, what kind of support has it got now? I mean, APAN, the, the uh, Palestinian advocacy group here in Australia, was very much encouraging people to support South Africa's action in the ICJ. I saw David Pocock uh, tweeting out he's sort of on board. Yeah. Maureen Fruki tweeted out in support. I mean, what is the official Greens position? Are we all, we're all on board and encouraging the Australian government and calling on them to make a public statement in regards to, to this case? Absolutely, right? absolutely. We need public statements. I mean, I was just going through, um, you know, as I came back um, this week into the office and was kind of re-checking up. Like you go back over the social media feeds of our prime minister and our foreign minister and there's just no mention of the fact that there is a horrific, you know, attack happening right now where hundreds of thousands of people have been displaced they just don't mention it. It's just ignored from all their social media. They're just not talking about it. We need public strong support from the Australian government when it comes to the international framework. And that means backing in South Africa and the ICJ. But I think, and the action of the ICJ, I think the other thing that is really critical though, and I think this is so important, is that we know that even though the, the as you said, Tom, that the, 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 decision won't come down for a while, the political pressure will build. The more that we see the documentation of the evidence put forward by South Africa and their legal team, and the more we see the denial by Israel as it being baseless, 
when in actual fact we can all see what's going on. Mm. So I think in that sense, you know, what we what we need to be doing is putting the pressure on. And I know locally there's, you know, uh, mums for Palestine and families for Palestine that are actually mobilising every week outside of the Prime Minister's office in Marrickville just mm. down the road from me. Um, and we know that there are rallies happening everywhere um, you know, even when I was down in Tazio for the break visiting family, like there was amazing like Palestinian activists standing and community members standing supporting a ceasefire on one of the main roads of Tazi, getting people to honk in support of a, a free Palestine. You know, like this is this is something that the Australian government cannot ignore, even though they're trying very hard to. Mm, yeah, because Albanese hasn't like it, they've refused to take any position publicly on the on South Africa's case right so yeah. far yeah yeah <laughs> I mean I was and I was really pleased to see that's right that that Maureen did I think on Thursday night tweet out um that Australian the Australian government must back the case against Israel before the ICJ to ensure accountability under international law and the genocide convention I I feel as though like my understanding was maybe there has been some hesitancy within the Greens to come out and explicitly label this a genocide. I think that like there's that resolution that was was passed yeah. through official party processes to become, you know, part of Green's policy in June last year. Yeah. yeah. That recognizes that um, Israel is practicing the crime of apartheid. But the events of, you know, from from October onwards and what we would argue, yeah, now is the the early stages of, of a genocide or is genocidal intent. There hasn't been like an official, I guess, Greens party process to to recognize that. Um but yeah. I, and I don't know where that's up to and whether something is is needed, but I, I feel proud that, you know, Marine as as acting leader, as I understand it, came yeah. out with that statement so yeah absolutely I mean and I think it comes so like to put my old amnesty hat back on it kind of comes mm. to a kind of the 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 like international legal semantics about who determines if something is a genocide or not and yeah. I think that like you know I think in our in 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 the everyday use if you like of the word genocide and genocidal attacks and genocidal rhetoric like all of that is there and I don't think that that is deniable by anybody I think that the question then comes who is it that gets to determine a genocide mm, right. and where does that sit in things then becomes the question. So it's yeah. it's it's the I think that becomes the issue which is kind of, if you like, irrelevant to the horror that is going on on the ground. But I think mm. in terms of what you've identified as like where or how or how those words come together, I think it's important to mm. recognise it's a little bit it, on an international level it would be perhaps like the idea of referring to someone as a murderer before yeah. the case has been conducted. Right. But you can yeah, absolutely right. say a murder has Almost taken place. Yeah. You know, and so and so yeah. I guess I would say to you that I think that it's it, the Greens have been absolutely like strong in this position of how these attacks have been genocidal, that the rhetoric mm -hmm. has been horrific. I think the question around who determines that in terms of a discussion right. around the international law perspective has meant that even some like, you know, some really staunch Palestinian folks here that are within that international legal framework have taken the choice to not use that word because of the yeah, very strict okay. legal kind of international kind of determination on that as opposed yeah. to everyone being very clear that what is happening right now is horrifically, you know, moving towards what is an attempt to to wipe out Palestinians mm. from Gaza. Which is yeah. different to, I think, perhaps like the the public discourse driven primarily by, I suppose, you know, the Zionist lobby. 100%. Um, which is that, you know, the word genocide is inappropriate purely because it is triggering for Jewish people, given, you know, probably the strongest association with the word genocide is that of the Holocaust mm. and the yes. trauma associated with that means that we shouldn't use genocide to apply to, you know, the Jewish state in, in Israel, yeah. which, I mean, is really like the logic isn't there. Um, yeah. And I think as, as a lot of, pe you know, pe people like um, activists within, you know, Jewish Voice for Peace, for example, would say that never again means never again to anybody. Um, so I think that's a helpful distinction when, yeah, yeah. what you yeah. just explained, that it's it's yeah. actually more about that kind of legal question than whether we can say it's a genocide. Yeah, and I think I think you're right. There are two different there are two different sort of um, takes on that. And I think the other part that is really phenomenal about that, going which I think links the two together, is the whole point of the never again idea was to establish these frameworks in an international setting such yeah. that it didn't happen to anyone ever again. And we learn from this experience and then we set up frameworks to deal with it. And now we have a situation where 
the reason for doing that is now being denied to mm. other yeah, people. Yeah, the irony. Mm. Yeah. yeah. But I think yeah. it's so interesting. I mean, yes, some people might still very much be cautious, hesitant to use that word. It's the G mm. word. You know, don't throw that term around flippantly. But we saw almost exactly the same story with apartheid, right? Now, I'm not yeah. saying it's 100%. not still controversial to refer to Israel as, as an apartheid state in some people's view. But certainly a few years ago, it was just completely unacceptable. You would not hear about it. Now, since then, we've had leading human rights organizations, including yeah. Amnesty, describing um, Israel as operating a system of apartheid, particularly the occupied territories, and also more broadly, people would argue, and just you know, just see how when the facts come to light and when all that effort that you talked about before, Jenny, in, and that movement is built over time, people come to see those things much more clearly. And we recognize this, this <laughs> previously unthinkable idea that you would accuse Israel of doing such a thing is actually backed up by the facts and by their actual actions that are occurring right now in Gaza. Absolutely. And I think that is the, that is the power of what is the kind of movement on the streets, if you like, that doesn't, that means that we can't just leave it to the lawyers or the politicians or the people that are into like following those is that we need to create the space for it, right? We need to be able to strongly and staunchly say that Israel is an apartheid state and we need to be able to say that they're currently undertaking genocidal attacks and that genocide is occurring, occurring in Palestine. Those things have to be said in the public arena in a way by activists, by people on the street, by people mobilising because it creates the political pressure and the space for those discussions to be had. But also the for it's then the people, exactly, but also yeah. then for people to not be like too shy to say it. And like you mentioned at the beginning, like, you know, it's been a pretty – like, you know, the the level of kind of, you know, the vitriol that you get back when you say those kind of things is quite intense in terms of social media and emails and whatever. But I think if if you don't take, if you don't create that space and sort of push those boundaries, then you don't open up the space for the political debate to happen. And like, we, we cannot stay silent. The, the level of influence of the Israeli lobby and the Zionist lobby in Australia mm. is really, really scary. And I think that we, it should not be underestimated. Yeah. Uh, I, I think people should boycott Woolworths. I would advise very strongly uh, to take your business elsewhere, to go to IGA or Coles or LD, uh, for Woolworths to start taking political positions to oppose Australia Day uh, is against the national interest, the national spirit. And most Australians, uh, I think, just want to go to Woolies, get groceries at the cheapest possible price uh, because a lot of them are struggling to pay the bill when they get to the checkout at the moment. I don't want to go into Woolworths and be told how I need to vote, how I feel about Australia Day. Uh, if I want to go into Woolworths and purchase uh, all of the paraphernalia to celebrate Australia Day with my next door neighbours or my family or my mates, well that's something that I should be able and entitled to do. So, Jenny, new year, new you. Have you got any particular goals for, for 2024? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, feel, I feel like I'm feeling like a new year old me kind of vibe. Yeah. But um, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I look, I think I feel, I feel like a broken record. I feel like since I got elected in 2015, I was like, this year we're going to end no grounds evictions in New South Wales oh, and stop the unfair that. eviction of people. <laughs> And it's like, then we had like, I don't know if you remember this guy called Luke Foley, who used to be the leader of the New South Wales Labor Party. Anyway, he committed to that. And then, you know, various liberal ministers told me that they were trying to get it through cabinet. And then we kind of got excited because then Labor looked like they were going to win and they promised they were going to do no grounds evictions. And then the Libs said that they also supported it. So we literally now have the Labor Party, the Liberal Party. Okay. The Greens were there from the beginning. Yes. Yep. All the crossbench. All want to end no grounds evictions in New South Wales. Great. Just at the end of last year when I sort of asked the minister, so how are we going with that um, thing? He said, oh, oh, it's very complex. There's oh, a lot of right. things to navigate. It's always so and complex, it's like, isn't it? <laughs> literally the Liberal opposition in New South Wales in the chamber yelled out, why is it so complex? We even support it. <laughs> and That's so funny. And wow. I was like, we've got all the numbers. All yeah. the numbers are here. Like. It's, it's not, not a complex, complex set of numbers when every person sitting in the chamber supports it. Anyway, yeah. so hopefully this year in New South Wales, we will finally end unfair no grounds eviction. So okay. Yes, is, there, okay. is there any attempt to justify that policy decision or is it like we don't want to talk about this and the property lobby gives us money and we don't want no, to No, so this, the sticking bit 
is whether you can evict someone at the end of their lease. So basically That's we're saying. That's what a no grounds eviction is. So yeah. so basically you, yeah, yeah, you're on it. You're <laughs> on it. Oh, my gosh, maybe you should be. Maybe so you should be the day. minister. <laughs> I think you should the consider party. being a minister in the New <laughs> yes. South Wales Labor government responsible for renters. You're on it. Like you get yeah. it, right? Yeah, well yeah. done. See if there's a job open. Um. <laughs> totally. So, yeah. Um, so, basically, that is apparently the sticking point. Look, where we're at is that, you know, the situation is dire. Someone forwarded me something this week. It was going around, you know, that basically someone was trying to rent in uh, an inner city suburb of Sydney a mattress on a floor in a tiled living room for $185 a week. Oh, my God. With, like, like one of those screens coming up and then the other side of your bed was the fridge. Ah, good. (laughs) Yeah, you know, some people like a bit of kind of static noise, static hum to sleep, so could be a bonus. Who needs white noise? Oh, it's like a white – you don't need the white noise. You've got the fridge buzz. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, nice. Hang on, on, guys. Let's hear about what location was it. Was it near the (laughs) beach? Is it an up-and-coming neighbourhood? That's right. Are there good amenities? Oh, no, no good. I think it was in Botany, so you get to be with Theo. Oh, well. (laughs) Okay. Okay, Not so bad after all. I know what people are complaining about. I mean, it's like – Yes, I it's think it's a vibrant that- neighborhood with, with <laughs> So anyway, so our mission our mission is to finally end no grounds evictions, but we also need to deal with rent regulation because the yeah. the rents are have been rising astronomically, you know, across the country, but New South Wales is out of control. It's not enough to just talk about like um capping rents. We need to re-regulate rents because actually the the cost they're at currently is just people cannot afford that level of rent. And so mm. we have to have a, a genuine conversation about rent regulation. And I'm really keen to start that conversation. Sadly, in New South Wales, it seems like all we actually talk about is like NIMBYs versus YIMBYs mm. and Oof. cutting the red tape Most and discourse. barriers for, uh, you know, the construction industry to build more homes. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. you know, the thing that I always say, and I remember this so clearly, is that like pre-COVID, we had in New South Wales record levels of supply and mm-hmm. record levels of homelessness. Mm-hmm. Mm. And if supply is the answer to ending homelessness and solving the housing crisis, then that is not possible. What's the but go? We did have that. Why we did, did have yeah. that. Yeah. So yeah. really, there's like to me, I am just like so over this nimby yimby shit. Yeah. And so my my sort of you know our collective office mission for the year <laughs> is that we are going to we are going to blow that up. Yay! All right. Well, I'm not I would sure very how. much appreciate that. Not sure if how. You, can sort but, that out. you know, we are yeah. we are keen for for weighing in on that. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's funny. Like, so I ask you your goals for 2024 instead of like eat more veggies. It's like renters, uh, which I love. (laughs) And I think is extremely zeitgeisty. We kind of wanted to, you know, we've already had one episode come out this year, but we wanted to chat to you for a bit of a, I guess, forward look at the year to come. Yeah. I think it's pretty clear to anyone though, that housing and renting is going to continue to be one of the biggest issues. And maybe we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that because there are a few, there are state and territory elections coming up. Theoretically, there could be a federal election this year. I think a lot of us hope that it doesn't happen this year because to be honest, I think um, the prime minister probably doesn't want it to happen this year. So surely not. Right. Um, I mean, they've done crazy things before, but Mm. is it, so in New South Wales, you've got just local elections in September. That's correct. We've got a council election and we're expecting, I mean, it's likely there'll be some kind of by-election at a state level this year. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone expects Dominic Perrottet to stick around much longer on the backbenches of the New South Wales Parliament reading his book uh, during question time. (laughs) Um, So... I would expect we'll probably have we'll probably have a couple of by elections at a state level, but yeah, I don't. Mm. I mean, I don't expect we'll have a federal one this year. Obviously, yeah. you never know, but um, yeah, we've got a local one in September, yeah. and there'll be lots of talk about you know NIMBYs and NIMBYs and councils and of course housing yeah. for that. Yeah. So you, according to the number in front of me, Tom tells me that you have sixty three local councillors, which is crazy to me because, like in Queensland, we have one, but we have a very yeah. different system. <laughs> but yeah, that's yeah. a massive. Like, what is that going to to look like? You know, what are the Greens' kind of prospects and and plans for the local elections in New South Wales? Then, 
Yeah, we have a we have a huge representation of councillors, and we always have. And I think our council representation and where we've got controls of councils has usually then linked to our state success. And mm. you know, in a, in a different world, if um if it wasn't the prime minister and the environment minister holding our federal seats, we might have seen some connection to to federal success as well. Mm. Um, but you know, if you look back over the history of it, so the Greens controlled Marrickville Council and had the mayor of that council. So well before, which is part of the area that covers the seat of Newtown. Yeah. Many, many years ago. And then also Jamie Parker, who was our Greens member for Balmain, was the mayor of Leichhardt Council and the Greens had control of Leichhardt Council then as well. So basically you see like where and then up in Ballina, where my Greens colleague Tamara Smith is the mm. is the state MP, we had the mayor of um Byron Council for yeah. a long time as well. So I think you see that type, kind of connection where the the local Greens support then grows into what has been broader support but beyond that we have like lots of councils across the state where we have sort of like one councillor sitting on the council you know like Mm. doing their thing pushing the agenda and so that's a focus but one of the key things for us I think given the focus as you say Emerald on housing is actually looking at the role that councils can play Mm. in terms of requiring developers to put in affordable housing, making sure the state government is giving councils the support they need through the planning laws to be Mm. able to implement that, but also empowering local councils to actually identify, hang on, we have a huge homelessness problem here, or we have an issue with boarding houses closing, or we have an issue with um, the need for infrastructure here, or this refuge is oversubscribed and we need more support. So I think part of it is what the council can deliver themselves But the other part is the councils and the local community being and local representatives being closer to the ground to be able to say, actually, we need more state funding for this or we need more federal intervention here for Mm. these kinds of housing or these kind of projects. I think that's key. Mm. The other bit that I think is interesting is then looking at what stuff can councils do to help people. Like in the seat of Newtown, we've got 60% of people rent, right? Now, everyone knows when you have to move house, when you're renting, you have to pay for a removalist truck, you have to hire a van, you have to deal with a whole lot of like, you know, furniture that doesn't fit or does fit or whatever. Is there things that local councils can do, like they provide support to rate payers around like, you know, free collection of rubbish or whatever? Mm. Can they do the same for renters and say, Mm. actually, the council has vans to hire so you can get a free council van when you're moving rather than having to pay the like 500 bucks to rent a van for the day, you know, like yeah. little things like that yeah. that councils can do. But that oh, will we'll undercut be- the private enterprise and man oh my with gosh. a van will be furious. Mm. Imagine providing services for your local government. Can you imagine all the removalists right now coming to you with that? <laughs> uh, well, no, removal. because we know that in most cases renters are actually just torturing themselves with like someone's car that they borrowed yeah. doing yeah, 85 trips because yeah. no one can afford the van, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like actually those things help. I'm sure that there'll still be some, you know, some some wealthy folks that will pay the removalists. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's so, I mean, similarly, so Queensland has local government elections yeah. in March very soon. Actually, I think it's now less than 10 weeks, uh, which is fucking terrifying. And yeah. it, it's a, a similar story for us that, like, I think when we got Jono Suranganathan elected to council in 2016, even though we only got one, yeah. that was like a breakthrough moment that I think certainly had an influence on our ability to then break through in state and then in federal. And it will be council in March and then state in October. Yeah. Um, and yeah, housing is is going to be a massive issue for us. I think what what's interesting as well is, yeah, like this is a, we have a very pro-development council in Brisbane City Council. For context, for anyone who doesn't know, Brisbane City Council is very different to other councils. It's fucking massive. Yeah. It is almost like a small state government. It's the mm. biggest local government in the Southern Hemisphere and it, it, yeah, like they, so that's going to be a massive focal point for, for this and gain, I think, garner more attention than other council elections might. But it's a very pro-developer LNP-led council. It's branded, unlike a lot of other councils in, in Queensland. A lot of them don't do party branding. But they cut taxes for developers and then 
said, oh, suddenly we don't have enough money for all the things that we said we were going to do. And so we're cutting $400 million from the budget and cutting spending on things like parks and footpaths and and whatnot. So that I think is a very interesting frame for the Greens. And as you say, in the whole NIMBY YIMBY discourse, where there is this line from the developer lobby completely bought by both major parties that to be pro-housing, you have to be pro-developer. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. is something that we are very much trying to break because it's a fucking lie mm. and pointing out the ways that, you know, a council like the LNP are so pro-developer and are not pro-fucking housing. And here are all the ways that we could actually deliver more housing, like, as you say, inclusionary zoning, getting developers to build more yeah. public housing or a tax on vacant homes or on vacant land or um, properly regulating Airbnbs, all those things. And then totally. to see how that's received by the electorate in March, I think will be a real, I guess, thing to watch for then how we go into the state election and then how we go into federal. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's really, I think it's it's really with that. And I think it's so exciting to see some of the things that, that Jono has put forward in terms of reimagining like public space around yeah. the, like, you know, around a race course or whatever. And I think this is the thing where it links to that kind of like, how do we break up this nimby yimby kind of stuff? Mm. Is it like, you know, I use, we've got this incredible like rail corridor in the electorate of Newtown, like inner city prime land, right? And it's, yeah. it's rail lines, right? And either yeah. side of it is like, you know, amazing old rail carriages, like heritage value and all of this. When I was first elected, the former Liberal government sold off some of that site, privatised it. So don't forget all the rail heritage and everything else you lost, which was a complete mm. disaster, but then gave it to Channel 7 to put their like offices there. <laughs> cool <laughs> like and so it's like we've got Kong Bank and Channel 7 and it's like you're right. this is was public land yes oh right next so to the busiest station yeah. one of the busiest stations in Sydney that could have been amazing housing mm. Mm. yeah perfect but you yeah. did that and then we get called Mindy's for not exactly. wanting that thing and it's like well we didn't really want some more office buildings right like but yeah. give me the housing Would love and so housing. I think this is the you know so I'd love more housing give us more housing mm. but don't give us housing that is they're not going to be affordable to anyone and that is going to Useful. deliver massive profits yes. to developers. Yeah. Give us yeah. good, affordable public housing. Yeah. And then yeah. we love it everywhere. You know, <laughs> I, I used to live in Hong Kong. I have no fear of density. You yeah, know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I love the, to density. The que- yes, like the solutions that the major parties continue to propose just continue to drive prices higher and higher and the problem just gets worse and worse. Yeah. I have heard some people saying that on the, the federal level, we may have another half on our hands, uh, which is kind of terrifying. You know, the Housing Australia Future Fund debate that we spoke about a lot last year was very intense. I personally believe was a like an opportunity where the Greens really kind of, you know, proved ourselves on on housing and kind of radicalised a lot of people and particularly a lot of renters during that period. But it was obviously some of the discourse was fucking stupid. But we now have (laughs) Labor's quote, help to buy scheme, or as Adam Bant has has called it, the hard to get yeah. housing scheme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Got him. Um, Got him. The, the Greens are going to be in balance of power on in the Senate again. I don't know exactly when that is meant to come back, but at some point this year, Labor is again going to find themselves having to negotiate with the Greens on a housing question. And the Greens are again saying, we want a fucking rent freeze and we want caps on, rent to, on rental increases because report after report, keeps coming out saying that rental increases are just going to continue. There was a mm. new report, I think, just what this week, Tom, that that said that um, combined capital city rents rose 13.2% year on year and will uh, the shortage of rental properties will continue to drive prices up. Yeah. 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 Still going on. Shock but- horror, 2024, the rents keep rising <laughs> yeah, because, because nobody because puts in a rent them. cap or yeah. a rent yeah. freeze or any yeah. rent regulation. Yeah. I think that, I mean, the thing there is it's like we've got to remember, like, you know, the when it comes to protecting the rights of renters, like the Labor Party is just so lacking in any commitment to do that. Like mm. to the point where even during COVID, right, like I remember being in the middle of COVID, being in Parliament And Labor in New South Wales were in opposition and we were passing emergency COVID legislation and we managed to secure the libs to get something in there around rental protections. And no one was sort of really know, like it was at that point where no one knew what COVID was, how you got it or whatever. So everyone was sort of like standing away from each other, not really knowing what's happening in this tense moment. And Labor still had talking points where every time they mentioned renters, they talked about landlords first. Yeah. So they would say, and, and we're so pleased to see 
that there's provisions to help landlords and tenants, and tenants continue. Yeah. And and so it's like we're in the middle of a global pandemic. We all don't know if we're going to die because we're all in a room together and you've still got the talking points that make sure you say landlords before you <laughs> yeah. say tenants. Yeah. Like it was just I, like I just feel like that is where is we're breathing. at, right? Yeah. That is. Yeah. But as for the debate around like where we're at and using the balance of power, like, you know, I think in the last – in the last week, we've seen that, you know, all of a sudden there's talk about dental into Medicare. Like, oh, my God, that's a cool yes. idea. Where did Labor get that from? Mm. Wow. Maybe yeah. the Greens. Almost and like then, it you works. Know, and then you've got this whole discussion around, like, where we're at. Like, I, I remember having a conversation a long time ago and saying to someone, you know, around the marriage equality debate and being like, at the mm. point where everyone forgets that we were pushing for marriage equality is the point where you know you're close to winning. Yeah, and you you don't do it. You don't do it because you want you know. And I remember when Obama changed his mind and on marriage equality, and there were all these beautiful memes of like Obama riding like a rainbow unicorn. Mm. (laughs) And I was, and I said, you know what? We will never get the memes about the rainbow unicorns because we always believed in that thing. Yeah. 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 So when people change their mind and all of a sudden care about renters or no grounds evictions or whatever, and then everyone celebrates how wonderful they are, it's like. Yeah, I mean, maybe you should have had just like a more principled stance at the start, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's to me is the way that I do my politics. I'm happy by the time people forget that it was us, that's when mm. we know we're moving in the right direction. <laughs> yeah, I've certainly had those moments where you're like, this is so fucking frustrating because it feels like, yeah, it's usually Labor gaslighting you and being like, no, this is our idea. We always believe yeah. this. Yeah. And the media buy it. And you're like, what the fuck has just happened here? But then you're like, what has happened? is we've won something and yeah, like something totally. is going to change and it's what I wanted and that's yeah, yeah. good and, you know, if this is what it takes, then so fucking be it. I think we will most likely be back on the show talking about the help to buy scheme and the details of that and how, yeah. you know, it's effectively like a lottery for um, <laughs> for, for housing that will probably yeah. just increase prices for, for everyone else. But maybe before, because I, I think we're probably going to have to let you go soon, I want to hear what other predictions you have for politics in in 2024 and you know things that you think maybe the greens should do or not do in 2024 look look i predict that uh there will be a lot of fun and entertainment coming out of the uh brisbane city council uh (laughs) campaign i look forward to watching that and having uh some excitement around it i also I'm really hopeful that 2024 will bring us a New South Wales Labor government where the ministers recognise that they're in power (laughs) and they actually start making some decisions and doing some things rather than just Greens talking are so about quotes. Yes, this is you know? <laughs> you've got a utopia. Yeah. Just, just putting it out there. The just putting it out there. That, so I hope that the New South Wales Labor government ministers just realise that they are actually ministers and start doing some stuff and that would be yeah. great, like, yeah. you know, ending no grounds evictions. And then my other my other prediction is that I think that there will be more stouches uh, between Labor and the Greens, but I take that as a point of hope because the more that we stoush and the debate is around that, it means that the Liberals are becoming less and less relevant to the political discourse and that should be encouraged. Uh, and so I quite like that. And then my final one is that I really, really hope that I can think of an acronym that rhymes with NIMBY and NIMBY that indicates that I hate <laughs> NIMBY and Both NIMBY debates. <laughs> but I yeah, have yet to okay. be able to come up with it. So that is my own right. personal goal for 2024. You guys are much better at that than me. So if you come up with one, mm. can you please let me know? If any of our know? listeners have any ideas, yeah, send us an email, hello at seriousdangerpod.com <laughs> and we'll, we'll pass it on to Jenny or Thank I don't you. know. Tag us on Twitter. Tag both of us at Serious Danger AU. What's your um, Twitter? What's your handle, Jenny? It's Jenny Leong. It's Jenny Leong. I was an early adopter. Yep. Okay. Oh, easy. All right. <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone, give us your ideas for the Beyond Yimby Nimby discourse. Although, happening. to be honest, to be honest, my Twitter is fairly toxic at the moment, so don't go okay, there if you're feeling don't. fragile. So, I'll okay. say Fimby. Fuck, yeah. fuck in my backyard. Fuck in Just my fuck the whole thing. <laughs> Fimby it. Okay. Um, the other thing, everyone, just to say is that we really we still don't have a Human Rights Act in New South Wales, and New South Wales is lagging behind. There's indications that there is there is shifts in some of the Labor position on that. And so, in all seriousness, you know, as someone that was at Amnesty mm. when we were trying to get a federal Human Rights Act um, yeah. back in the Rudd Gillard Rudd kind of chaos, that's another thing that is on our agenda to try and you know mm. see if we can get some movement on that in um, the next year or two. 
And hopefully you can get a more effective one than the one we have in Queensland, which Ooh. I'm sad to say well, has yeah. not done too well in protecting yeah. human rights. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You've got to, to you've got to works. start. I was going to say you've got to start somewhere. And That's you know, right. at the moment, it's like uh, you know, we basically just have uh, endless laws that undermine people's human rights and give more mm. power to the police. So we'll see where we're at. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks for joining us on the show, Jenny. Good luck with all that in 2024. Uh, we appreciate your time and we'll talk to you again soon. Cheers. Thank you so much. Really great to chat to you both. Thanks, Jenny. Call to action this week. If you want to support um, or call on the Australian government to support South Africa's case against Israel, in the International Court of Justice, uh, there is the Australian Palestine Advocacy Network, aka APAN, has their form email that goes to your local MP. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, it's at apan.org.au, but it literally takes you know a couple of minutes. You can edit the email as you like. And I personally know as someone who works in an MP's office, like directly contacting your MP is one of the best ways. Obviously, if you can call them as well and tell them to put pressure on their party, if they're a Labor MP in particular, um, to to support that case or to, to get the government to support that case, then that is even more effective. And as we mentioned with Jenny, like the case will go for a very long time, mm. right? So even though with this coming out on Sunday and the beginning of the case was the past couple of days, you know, uh, support from the Australian government would would make a difference over a long period of time, and so keeping out that pressure is good. I sent that email to my local MP, Daniel Molino. He has not responded, nor has he responded to my follow up email response. about Palestine a few weeks ago. He sort of gave me the generic one, and then I replied with some follow up questions and got Bubkus. So Aww. Daniel Molino, I know you listen to the show. Email yeah. me back, bro. What's the deal? Come on, yeah. Um, I assume if you are still listening to this show that you got this far, you, maybe you like it, maybe you're asleep, maybe it's sleepy time. I don't know. But in your dreams, I'm telling you, you should rate and review us. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening now. That helps us. Apparently, it also helps if you're not following, subscribing or whatever to the show. Please do that. It helps us in the charts, as I understand it. Um, other way you can support us is, of course, by becoming a supporter on Patreon. It's three bucks a month or whatever you can pay. Helps pay Mike's wages and keep the show going. Um, you can also follow us on Sirius... Uh, you can, sorry, you can follow us on Serious Media, social media at Serious Danger AU. We're on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. All the links and stuff is at seriousdangerpod.com. And most importantly, remember we love you. We love you. Eat lamb, Bye. everyone, and love this country. You don't, you don't have to eat lamb. Bye. This is a serious danger, Australia.